بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم dear viewers ورحمة الله وبركاته welcome back to another episode of live in London with Sayyid Am with Dr. Sayyid Ammar Naqshwani where we continue to discuss and talk about the treaties of rights by Imam Sajjad peace and blessings be upon him now in today's episode we will be talking about insha'Allah the right of the stomach and that is the right of your stomach is that you make it not into a container for that which is unlawful to you and you eat no more than your fill. That is the right of the stomach in the Rasalat al-Hukuq, a book of rights and treaties of rights written by Imam Sajjad. Now I personally think this is a very important topic because we don't usually think about what we put into our stomachs on a day-to-day -day basis. I did earlier have a KFC, a bit of a cheeky KFC, so uh, I think I'm gonna get told off for that, but the point is we need to watch what we eat a bit more and we'll be talking about this with Dr. Sayyid Amman Akshawani inshallah so we bring you in inshallah Assalamu alaikum Sayyidna Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah I hope you're doing well Yeah it should, be a, should be a great show inshallah Alhamdulillah shukr uh, Sayyidna The right of the stomach mm. Do you think us as Western Muslims have more of an issue with this than Muslims in the East or, or back home whatever you want to call it? I think, you know, looking after our stomachs is an important issue whether you're in the East or in the West. Mm. I think observing the right of your stomach, however, it's, uh, that's a different uh, challenge altogether. Mm. Um, especially in the West because of the fact that there is more availability of that which is not halal. Mm. You see, if you're living, for example, in the Middle East, the situation is different where you have majority Muslim countries, mm. you know, if I'm living in Iraq, I know wherever I'm going to go, I'm not even going to question what's in the aswaq of the Muslimin, you know. You um, buy it, you eat it straight. Yeah, mm. and even if you're anywhere else in the Middle East, there's a recognition that everybody recognizes the, the law of the religion of Islam, even if it's not an Islamic state. And, um, and so those challenges may not necessarily come up as much and even the challenges of what you drink, for example. Um, maybe when you're living, for example, in the West, the mm. prevalence of pork, the prevalence of alcohol means that there's going to be a few more challenges for you. However, saying all of that, that does not mean that we forget about looking out after our stomachs and indeed looking after our health. Mm. You know, whether you're living in the Middle East or you're living in, in London, there is still a responsibility on the human being to ensure that they have healthy physical lives as well as healthy spiritual lives. I think in our mosques you'll find that there is a major focus from the imams of the mosques on having a very healthy spiritual life. Mm. And so what you have is many discussions on the nafs, many discussions on jihad in nafs, tasqiyat in nafs, on you know, making sure that you can discipline mm. the soul as much as you can. And I think there is far too little discussions on uh, looking after our physical health. And sometimes when you're looking at some of the people within the Muslim community, um, it's not unusual, for example, in, in the month of uh, Muharram to look around you and, and see some of the most unhealthy uh, bodies um, on earth and at the same time look at people who for example at the scene are spiritual so you're then asking yourself a question can I be someone who's spiritual but who's completely neglected my mm. body would the Ahlul Bayt have for example wanted people to be um, reaching levels of obesity mm. where they're not looking after their health at all I must put a disclaimer out there that I know there are people who face physical challenges which mean it's extremely difficult for them to maybe look as they'd want to. You know, not everybody genetically may be predisposed mm. to uh, being able to lose weight uh, quickly or being able to look after their health, um, you know, in, uh, with ease as much as others. Like you, Sukhni, I know very well, are the type of person, I, you know, I, I say this to all the viewers, that this is someone who can have uh, a donor kebab every day of the week and not gain any weight you know it's and, a, it's and that, a, that's that really, a problem see, honestly. that's not a problem at all <laughs> on the contrary you know you're able to have that junk food and you're 
I don't know if you're observing the rights of your stomach Islamically, but you're able to have that <laughs> junk food and you can get away with it. If you look at some of our team in the back, <laughs> you'll find that no names <laughs> we're not going to mention any names <laughs> and uh, it wouldn't really be Riba because... <laughs> they're technically right. <laughs> they're, they're, it'll, be, it'll be front biting. But I think if you're going to look at some of them in the back, you'll find that... Uh, they, um, they are telling me it's because they sit in chairs all day. So it's not they their fault. They sit in chairs all day. There's some great gyms. I think there's a gym literally across <laughs> the road, the road yeah. where they can go and they can work out and they can look after their stomachs. And I think that's why now the <coughs> increase in people who are having surgeries on their stomachs, mm. in some cases you do have people who have reached a level of obesity. Um, and that is in some <coughs> cases because those people did not have the willpower mm. to be able to discipline themselves. Others, mm. no, they try their hardest in the gym as much as they can, but they cannot look after themselves. Mm. So I think whether you're on the West or you're on the East, there remains that challenge to make sure you look after the, the right of your stomach, not only by staying away from that which is haram, but also by ensuring that that which you do eat, you think about. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but Surah 80 verse 24, don't make your stomachs graveyards for animals. Does that mean Ahl al-Bayt promoted a vegetarian diet? Surah 80 verse 24 of the Holy Quran says فَلْيَنظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِهِ Let man have a look at the food that they eat. And there is two ways of looking at that eye of the Holy Quran. The first way of looking at that eye of the Holy Quran is literal. Have, make sure that you ponder over that which you are eating. I think I'm one of those people who sometimes is uh, very negligent when mm. it comes to the food that we eat. As long as I, for example, am told by one of the workers that it's halal, that's enough for me. Mm. And sometimes maybe a person should ask a few more questions, especially when you're living in the West. You find that we neglect the possibility that even when you're eating something you know, let's say you're eating cod somewhere, they may have put white wine all over it, or they may have put red wine on this salad, and you'll find that many of us don't even ask questions about these mm. things. And that there does need to be more of a pondering, because there is a famous saying which is very important for all of us to understand, and that is that you are what you eat. Mm. And that's not an Islamic saying. That's a saying that's recognized by all the rational minds that the human being is what they eat. They become a reflection of what they eat. What they <laughs> eat, whatever you eat has a particular energy that surrounds it. You know, for example, Hinduism and Buddhism may take that to one extreme. Other religions may take it to another, where for example, they may tell you that you shouldn't have any meat whatsoever because there may be a certain negative energy associated mm. with the sacrifice. But when the Quran said, فَلْيَنظُرَ insanu." The Quran was trying to make clear to us that that ta'am that comes in our lives, we have to ponder very carefully uh, because that could easily have an effect on our spiritual lives as well. You know, our physical and spiritual lives are interconnected. Um, and you find that many of the great scholars, when you ask their mothers about the way they live their life, they were very picky on a couple of things. One of them is that they'd always be in a state of wudu while pregnant. And another is that they'd always be wary of not eating that which is even something which is dubious. Now, technically speaking, you may look at something and say, well, as long as it's halal, that's enough for me. But what if someone turns around to you and says that that particular restaurant, I heard that the meat that they bring one day might be halal, the next day if there's not enough halal, they don't mind buying haram. Some people will not take any care with that. So others will turn around and say, hold on, if there's a shek surrounding this food, I know that technically as long as it says halal, that's enough, but there's a difference between, for example, the different levels of spirituality in Islam relating to these things. There is someone who, for example, might be a Muslim, another might be a mu'min, another might be someone with taqwa, another might be someone with wara, another might be someone mm -hmm. who reaches the level of ikhlas. And, you know, there's all these different spiritual levels. God could have easily used one word, but when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used a number of words, it's, it's related and very much correlated to 
how careful you are, not just with the halal and haram, but also with the areas where there might be, for example, <coughs> karaha in them, mm. that it might be reprehensible, that there might be some foods, for example, which are makruh. Now, mm. you know, us Muslims, the moment we hear something's makruh, we're still going to do it. You know, and I know that there... As long as it's not haram. <laughs> as long as it's not haram, as long as they say it's makruh, I'm going to jump in and do it. And I think, I think sometimes what we don't realize is that act which is makruh can have a, a negative effect on us spiritually. Yes, it's not prohibited, but it's not something that's going to get us closer to Allah mm. subhanahu wa ta'ala spiritually. So even therefore, when it comes to the area of فَلْيَنظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِهِ لَا let mankind ponder about the food that they eat. The first meaning of it was literally food. There is a second meaning which I want to mention, which I still think is very important, is that Imam al-Baqir says, فَلْيَنظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِهِ is let mankind ponder over food for thought. Mm. Now just think about this. Food can be literal, yes? There's also food for thought. When someone's got a good idea, or someone wants to explain something to you, he goes, let me give you something as food for thought. Mm. That's not literally you eating their idea. Um, rather, uh, that is a particular piece of knowledge that's going to mm. come to you. And Imam al-Baqir says, فَلْيَنظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِهِ uh, As you mentioned, Surah 80, verse 24 of the Holy Quran, Imam al-Baqir states that, let man ponder over the knowledge that's mm. reaching them. That sometimes in our lives, we have to really ask ourselves a question. Who's giving us food for thought? Sometimes in our life, the person who's giving us lectures, a person who's giving us advice, a person who's an imam of a masjid, I do still have to ponder about that which they give me. Mm. Some people say, no, <laughs> if this person says something, I take it blindly. No, not at all. I think the Quran and the ethos of the Quran is for us to reflect, hold on, where's this ta'am, this food for thought, this ilm, where's it coming from? Is it coming from a good source or an unhealthy source? Is it coming from a legal source or a prohibited mm. source? You know, so lawful source or prohibited. So I think there is two ways of looking at this ayah. But I think the literal way is important. That فَلْيَنْظُرَ الْإِنسَانُ لَا طَعَامِهِ Make sure you think about that ta'am, how it's been processed. Has it been slaughtered properly? Is it something clean? Is it something that's going to help your spirituality before you eat it? Uh, I want to apologize for misquoting the ayah earlier, but back to what I did mention, don't make your stomachs a graveyard for animals. Does that actually mean that we should be vegetarians, essentially? No, don't make your stomachs graveyards for animals is a, is a famous hadith of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. And I think what Imam Ali was saying was, guys, you know what? Not too much meat. Mm. You know, I think if you look at our mosques, if we don't have meat... If it's then, not on the menu that day. <laughs> yeah, if it's not on the menu, especially in the, in the Arab countries, if you look at the way they break their fast in the holy month of Ramadan, you, th you really are amazed at the amount of meat that's there. Mm -hmm. What's even more amazing is how much of it is thrown away. And I, I think that there is a lot of us in our lives, if we don't have meat in a meal, we get disgruntled, we get unhappy. It's as if meat is fundamental to... Uh, our lifestyle and when you're looking for example at the Holy Prophet peace be upon him and his family the Holy Prophet didn't notice that there were certain people who thought that if you don't um, eat meat or you don't perfume yourselves or you don't have sexual relations then this was a sign of zuhd this was a sign of asceticism or spirituality mm -hmm. I remember Uthman bin Mad'oon um, you know there are certain people who say why did Imam Ali alayhi salam have a son called Uthman and and he names his son Uthman after Uthman bin Mad'un. And Uthman bin Mad'un was one of probably the 14th revert to the religion of Islam. And Uthman bin Mad'un, one day, the Prophet, peace be upon his family, is discussing with his wife Aisha about, um, you know, generally about the community. And Aisha was talking about the fact that she couldn't believe how Uthman bin Mad'un's wife, who used to be such a good looking lady, had completely neglected herself. And so when she asked her, why have you neglected yourself? You used to be one of the most beautiful girls in the whole of Arabia. And now you just don't care about yourself anymore. And she's like, well, who do I have to look after myself for? My husband stopped putting 
you know, stops sexual relations now. He stops perfume, stops eating meat because he thinks that this is a sign of al muttaqin mm. That if you're the type of person who doesn't eat meat or doesn't have sexual relations, then you're a muttaqin. And the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, interesting, the narration mentions how he leaves his house not in a state of happiness at all. It's a state of sadness that why is my community thinking that by staying away from sex or staying away from the eating of meat or staying away from perfume or aftershave, then that means that you're going to be someone who's counted as religious. Mm. <laughs> so when he tells Uthman bin Mad'un, he explains to him, he says to him, Uthman, I am of those who has sex in terms of I'm the one, I am those who's married. I am of those who uses perfume and I am of those who eats meat. So therefore, if a Muslim thinks when Imam Ali alayhi salam says, don't make your stomachs graveyards for animals. Yes, meaning don't have, for example, lamb here and uh, let's say chicken here and more lamb Chunks. and more donors <laughs> and a couple more donors and a cheeseburger and a quarter pounder and a couple more me, donors, hungry, you know, and I'm <laughs> making, you know, making myself hungry at the moment. But when, when Imam Ali alayhi salam says, don't make it, he says, don't make it, uh, your stomach a graveyard for animals. What he's trying to say to us is that be moderate in the way that you eat. Mm. Um, even those who try and look after their bodies, you know, we mentioned in our discussions on Islam and sex, there's a phenomenal difference between those who look after their, the, what goes into their stomachs and their sex life. And when I'm saying sex life, I'm not talking about how much sex they have. Rather, I'm talking about how long they can last in their sexual relations. In their sexual relations, when you're looking at this, you'll find that there are certain people because of, for example, them not being, you know, looking after their, their bodies, you'll find that it's the type of person after 30 seconds, after 45 seconds, straight away you can hear the snoring. Whereas there are others, no, if they can look after their bodies mm -hmm. and what they're eating, I think that this is something that has a, a, a profound effect on their lives. So Imam Ali alayhi salam is not espousing that, oh, we all become vegetarians. Rather, he's saying that, you know what, maybe a bit more broccoli in the diet, maybe a bit more sweet potatoes in the diet, maybe the odd soup every once in a while, maybe have, you know, a variety, you know, try and change it up with some fish, with some chicken, mm. and try and think about making sure that you have a healthy balance in that diet. That will be something that will help you spiritually as well. Uh, <clears throat> Surah 5, Surah Al-Ma'adah, verse 3. Now the translation obviously might be a bit off, hopefully it's not. But the general idea is, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, prohibited to you are dead animals, blood, the flesh of swine, and that which has been dedicated to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those killed by strangling or by a violent blow or by a headlong fall or by the goring of horns and those from which a wild animal has eaten except what you are, able to slaughter and those which are sacrificed on stone altars and the last bit is and that you seek decision through divine arrows sure. so does that mean eating dead flesh or for example cannibalism yep as in doesn't need to be made clear that it's haram surely no one would do that sure that's a great question i i don't think there's a there's a religion that has as many dietary laws as mm. the religion of islam and I often get asked by people, what about the religion of Islam really made you want to remain a Muslim? Mm -hmm. You know, I've had this, you know, I've had these personal conversations with, with people in my, in my time. And there's two things that stand out for me. One is the relationship between God and the human being in the Quran, how God views the human being. Mm -hmm. But the second is that there is such an intricacy in every detail of the life of the human being. Mm. We discussed the sex life, the economic life, the political life, the life of purification mm. in the bathroom, every aspect, every aspect and mm. even when it comes to the area of eating food. Because if you repeat the verse again and you break it down, God here is speaking about, sometimes in the Quran, God speaks about that which is permissible for mm. you. Sometimes God speaks about that which is impermissible for you. Now. Someone might turn around and say, well, why are you guys so concerned about what's impermissible for you? Because if we believe that God wants to nourish mm. and wants to help the growth and development of the human being, 
I as a human being, if you left it to me, McDonald's, Burger King, I'll devour them and I don't care what burger comes from where. I don't care which animal's involved. If you take me to the Chinese takeaway, I want to go into that Chinese takeaway and I want to be in a situation where I can have, you know, pork chops. I want to be eating. I don't care how the pig gets slaughtered. I don't care who slaughters the pig. I don't care what, you know, what aspects of that slaughter, mm. what cleanliness is involved. However, Islam, on the other hand, try to make it clear that there are certain slaughterings, there are certain foods which are prohibited for you. If you repeat the verse again, you'll <laughs> see that there is a criteria for them. Okay, so from the start. Yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Prohibited to you are dead animals, blood, the flesh of swine, and that which has been dedicated to other than Allah. So, so you, for example... You asked me the question about cannibalism and mm. you said, well, will anyone, for example, eat that which is, which is already dead? You know, Hind, mother of Muawiyah, you know, found it as no problem to chew the liver of Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. Mm. One of the most disgusting acts which society as a whole accepts as disgusting and in the religion of Islam is eating the dead flesh of the human being, for example. Um, that is not something which is seen as being permissible. Um, and then you have, for example, within that verse, other areas which give us an indication of maybe how the Arabs were doing their slaughters. Because mm. we know when a Muslim slaughters an animal, for example, you've got part of the slaughtering process uh, is that the, you know, there's all these conditions which really amaze you in terms of just how intricate things must be. It's not just a matter of, oh, a Muslim has to say Bismillah and that's it, it's done. Mm. You know, firstly, make sure that that animal is an animal that is not slaughtered, for example, in front of uh, the family members, let's say, mm. of that animal. Um, there has to be a humanity there. There should be water given to that animal before it's slaughtered. We have the famous, uh, you know, narration which is there in Muharram and Safar where Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam famously asks the butcher that you give water to the sheep before you slaughter it. And Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam replies, uh, and the butcher replies by saying that, well, of course I do. Every animal deserves water before it is slaughtered. And he says, well, my father was not given water before he was slaughtered. And what you have at that moment is the Imam showing the importance of even giving water to the animal before the animal slaughtered. And then, you know, you have some countries, it's amazing, if you go on YouTube, there are some countries, they are so horrendous, some people, I should say, so horrendous in the way that they eat an animal. People don't realize this has an effect on your soul. I remember hearing that in the Far East, <clears throat> there are people who eat from the brain of the monkey. Now, if you say, for example, in their culture, that eating from the brain of the monkey is something which they allow. If you hear the way that this is done, it shows you the difference between that which is instituted by man for their own whims and desires and that which is inspired by the Lord. Mm -hmm. You'll find that what happens is they actually lock the monkey into a particular device and they'll crack open the skull of the monkey and begin to eat from the brain of that monkey while the monkey is dying. Now, this, on the day of judgment, we will be asked mm. if there was a cat that was thirsty. If we help the cat, then we will be looked after. If there was a dog that's hungry and we will be of those who have helped the dog, God will reward. Mm. But when an animal if you're going to accept that animals are there for us, they have a particular reason for their creation, that animal which you are going to slaughter, make sure that it's done in a way which doesn't bring barbarity to yourself. Mm. That's why the butcher in Islam is a reprehensible job. It's needed, but it's not something which is recommended mm. because you get used to blood being around you. But also with these animals, not only did Islam, the Quran, the world of hadith say, your stomach should never have these animals. Yes, the lamb, for example, sheep, beef, um, 
you know, fish, for example. These animals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. There is a particular uh, reason He has created them and has allowed us to consume them. But there are directives. You don't want negative energy to come into your stomach, which in turn has an effect on your spirituality. Mm. So what's amazing is that when you hear the story that Hind, the mother of Muawiyah, wife of Abu Sufyan, when Sayyidah Zainab السلام, saw Yazid in, in the court in Sham, she said to him, how can I hope for sympathy and compassion? from someone whose grandmother chewed the liver of the nobles. Now, what mm. I want to see and what I want to show all the viewers here is the correlation that Sayyidah Zainab shows us between what you eat and what you become. And what you, become. Mm. you see, how can I hope for sympathy and compassion? We all want people who are sympathetic and compassionate human beings in our life. Mm. No one disrespects a sympathetic or compassionate human being. People look at them with high esteem. When Sayyidah Zainab السلام, says, how can I hope for sympathy and compassion? From someone whose grandmother chewed the liver of the noble. What did the grandmother do? Grandmother chewed the liver of a human being, completely haram. Not just any human being, a noble human being. Mm -hmm. Sayyidah Shuhada Hamza, son of Abdul Muttalib. Here Sayyidah Zainab shows us something majestic for us when it comes to our stomach and what we have. If the slaughtering process is a process where we have contemplated on the animal, on the water to the animal, on where we slaughter the animal from, on the direction of slaughtering, on the words that are recited. Believe you me, I've seen videos. Now, People can turn around and say, well, these aren't authentic and so on. Mm. I've seen videos where animals have come to the slaughter upon hearing the Quran and have put themselves mm. in a particular position as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, for example, that animal with that disposition. Now, people out there might turn around to me and say, well, I don't believe in God. What do you mean animals are created with a certain disposition? We know very well that there is a certain disposition. There is a certain recognition of certain animals of their environments of their habitats that give us an indication of a small amount of uh, consciousness of presence mm. even for that animal. So in the religion of Islam, when the Quran gives us this verse, the Quran is making clear for us that the dietary laws is not to disrespect people who don't have these laws. Mm -hmm. You see, there may be other religions that don't have these laws. They might say to you, for example, that those animals that you've quoted or that death that you've quoted is something that should be allowed. Quran is saying, we don't want to disrespect you, but the Lord of the heavens and the earth, the Lord of the religion of Islam, is making clear to you that this is something which is prohibited for you. Mm. Yeah. A point you mentioned about Hind eating the liver of Hamza, just a side point. Does that mean that what you eat goes through your family as well and through your bloodline? Well, I don't want to necessarily say that it continues um, in the bloodline. Um, although, you know, Sayyidah Zainab, I think her point to Yazid is saying that, and it comes exactly in the next paragraph in her, if you were to read her khutbah, exactly the next paragraph she says, you boast about your disbeliever ancestors. Mm -hmm. So if a person looked at their grandmother chewing the body of a human being and regrets it, is sad about it, then that person will never have those traits. But when a person boasts about them, later, mm. I wish my ancestors from Badr were present to see what I've done, then at that moment, you may see a correlation. But I wouldn't say just because someone, Nabi Nuh, had the best diet on earth, his son was a disbeliever. Mm. So just because the father um, has the best health, Physically, it doesn't mean it's going to transfer mm. to the son. The son, everyone makes their own choices. Mm. Then, in that case, why is pork? No, why is Islam so anti-pork? Specifically, pork. Rather well, than well, I think Islam is not the only religion that mentions, as you mentioned mm. there, lahm al mm. You know what's translated normally as swine or the flesh of swine. Islam is not the only religion. Um, you know, Joel Erstein, the famous 
a Christian, mm. uh, you know, lecturer and man of religion in Houston, Texas, has a wonderful discussion on YouTube where he looks at, um, you know, he, he, he makes the joke that I don't want to ruin all your Sunday, you know, roasts or your Sunday lunches, but the Bible is very clear that this is something which is prohibited. You know, the, the pig, if you look at the pig, it's a scavenger. It's willing to even eat, you know, the, <laughs> anything, <laughs> virtually ab absolutely anything. You want to even throw excrement and feces near a pig. It's willing to devour it. It's willing to devour its own kid if it's dead, mm. you know. Um, there are certain even um, traits related to the pig that some have mentioned and others differ, you know, even willing to see another pig with its wife. You try go near a lioness. Um, in front of Mr. Lion, and you become a shawarma that <laughs> night, you know. But in, you know, with Mr. Pig, if you're if you're you know if you're cool enough, you know he doesn't mind you uh, having a good time with Mrs. Pig. Um, and so you know these traits um, are traits that we don't want to carry with us. Mm. I know that there are you know those in the medical field who are experts in medicine more than I'll ever be who'll be able to tell you of um, the way the pig lives its life, then in turn, the way the pig is slaughtered, how much of an effect medically on a negative level this has on the body of the human being. Mm. You know, there are discussions of the worms that grow in the human being after the consumption of, of pork. There are many people out there who will tell you about their experiences with pork and then having left the eating of pork, um, you know, and bacon and so on. And so... For us in the religion of Islam, it's on two levels. It's on the level of the physical and the level of the spiritual. That when something is prohibited within the religion of Islam, it has physical and spiritual, spiritual. disadvantages to the human being. Ahsan Tum Sayyidina, uh, before we continue with the discussion, I would like to take us to a quick break, inshallah, and remind the viewers they can call in. The number will be on your screen when we return, inshallah, and I will also call it out to you. Prepare your questions for the say to answer, insha'Allah, so we can be at your service. But for now, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa to live in London with Dr. Said Amar Naqshawani where we've been discussing the rights of the stomach. Now Sayyidina, this is a, a question that we discuss always with my friends, um, the question of fish or, or sea animals. Now we always have the punch ups when we go to restaurants, you know, why are you ordering this, why are you ordering that? So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to read out the ayah in the Quran uh, about this topic and I'm going to ask you about the different types of fish and tell me straight up. Tell well, me, let's yeah, discuss the let's verse. Let's discuss it first, then tell me want, a nice answer I can tell people. So the verse goes, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, lawful to you is game from the sea, and its food as provisions for you and the travel travelers. But forbidden to you is game from the land, as long as you sure. are in the state of Ihram. Sure. I think uh, it's interesting. What's the reference of the ayah, by the way? Um, Surah Al Ma'idah, verse 96. Well done, well done, Sufmi. I'm proud of your Thank preparation. You it's all so, the time I spend with you. <laughs> it's true. Surah 5, verse 96 of the Holy Quran. Yes, this question about fish is interesting because there are many people who are uncertain which fish is allowed, which fish is not allowed. And I think fish plays a major role, especially when you're living in areas where there's no halal meat, for example. Can't get halal meat, can't get halal chicken. Everyone's next option is fish. People straight away go to where? To fish. Okay. And so the question arises that the Quran, people always ask me, Surah 5 verse 96. It seems like every fish should be allowed. Because if you read the ayah again, what does it say exactly? L lawful to you is game from the sea. Lawful to you is game from the sea. So someone says that means Sayyidina, Everything that every sea. single fish in the sea I should be allowed to eat. I ask you a question. If you finish the ayah till the end, does it give you an indication that this may have a context? Read it till the end. What context could it be mm. about? So, 
lawful to you is game from the sea and its food as provisions for you and the travelers. Okay, so there's traveling happening there's traveling here. Happening. Okay. But forbidden to you yep. is game from the land as long as you are in the state of ihram. Ihram. Question. Mm. What does fish being allowed, all of it in the sea, have to do with ihram? Unless we're discussing here what can be hunted while you're in a state of ihram, not which mm. fish is allowed. You see, many times people, if they show you this ayah, and I respect all the madhahib in the religion of Islam, because all of them, whether it's Ja'fari, Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali, all of them have their own interpretation of these verses of the Holy Quran, depending where you're getting your teachings from. Many times when our people say, look, the Quran says that lawful for you is lawful what? Lawful for you is game from the sea. Game from the sea. And for the traveler. Mm. But it mentions Zihram. When it mentions Zihram, therefore, it gives us an understanding that, hold on, is what is at stake mm. here what fishes are permissible for you or what you can hunt while you're in a state of Ihram? Do you remember Imam al Jawad, السلام, when he was at that young age where they said he doesn't have much knowledge? Mm. And then the chief judge of Baghdad, Yahya bin Aktham, came to Imam al Jawad. And Imam was how old at the time? Imam al-Jawad was eight or nine. Mm. And I'll never forget that Imam al-Rada used to say that the greatest, you know, greatest blessing for Al-Muhammad mm. was the birth of Imam al-Jawad because Imam al-Jawad was really the first Imam of Ahlul Bayt where you could clearly tell that their knowledge is inspired by God. And, and that Yahya bin Aktham asked him a question about what's the kafara mm for someone who hunts while they are in a state of ihram. <laughs> Imam al-Jawad at the time, eight and a half, nine years of age. And Imam al-Jawad, everyone's like, how's he going to answer that one? Mm. What's the kafara for the one who goes hunting while in a state of <laughs> ihram? <laughs> Imam al-Jawad, alayhi salam, interestingly, turns around and he says he to him, <laughs> your question is, is quite vague, mm. O chief judge. And he says, what do you mean? He goes, are you talking about ihram for Umrah or ihram for Hajj? Normal animal or wild animal? Is it, for example, in the daytime or is it in the night? Did he know the law or he didn't know the law? In Mecca or out of Mecca? Da, 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 da. So he took him around in circles <laughs> telling him that your question is looking for one answer, but you need to break down your question because there's so many thousands of answers available. Mm. Now, this ayah in the Holy Quran is telling us that, for example, if I'm in the state of Ihram, hunting for fish is permissible. Mm. Whereas hunting for the land is not it's permissible. Not possible, it's not anything saying all fish in the sea are allowed. And the way we can understand this is, number one, tafsir of Ahlul Bayt. Number two, this is a Ja'fari and Hanafi opinion. Mm. Maliki, Shafi'i and Hanbali believe all fish in the sea can be eaten. Ja'fari and Hanafi say no, that there are conditions. Fish with scales can be eaten. Fish without cannot be eaten. Mm. And so even Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, I remember a, a narration in the Wasail of al hur al-Amili, there is a narration where the Imam you know, would, would go to people and tell them, Beware of eating fish without scales. Mm. Beware of selling fish without scales. To that extent. To that extent. Mm. Now, that means that when it comes to the Ja'fari school, we cannot eat all fish. We are able to eat the fish with scales. Someone says, okay, there might be a couple of jurists who say that you can eat all fish but they may put a karaha on it, reprehensibility, mm. makro. Some people say, well, I don't care if it's, as long as it's makro <laughs> and not haram, I'm going to eat it. Others will turn around and say, no, on the contrary. If the unanimous opinion of many of the maraja is that, you know, fish with scales is allowed, fish without. And remember, we're not the only ones. There are other religions, we forget madahib, mm. other religions that are very focused on the fact that fish with scales you can eat and fish without, you cannot mm. eat. Yeah. So this is the part <laughs> where we go through the fish, Sayyid. Yeah. Because a lot of these fishes have disputes on them, and I've seen it firsthand. God bless the fishes. God bless the fishes. Calamari. Haram. Straight up. 
حرام prohibited salmon halal sea bass halal oyster haram crab haram lobster haram cod halal trout halal yellowfish halal tuna halal so it's been split into scales and I think I should scales. get a, a new profession and <laughs> expert in, in fish. Um, but, you know, I, I don't want to ruin anyone's life out there. You know, there may be certain people I've just said calamari. I know a few or I just like said crab <laughs> or octopus or lobster, haram. And I might have uh, ruined their life. Now, I, I don't mean to ruin your life. Of course, I, I hope you have a, a fruitful life wherever you are. But I think when it comes to, you know, the maraja, the maraja or the grand scholars, in many of these cases are unanimous. Now, on some of these, you might find the odd opinion. For example, there's always a debate. Well, if you're saying fish with scales is allowed and fish without scales is not allowed, then why is it that you, you can eat prawns, for example, mm. or you can eat shrimps? Now, when we look at any eye of the Holy Quran, we look for the uh, teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, We have a clear narration the way Imam Al-Kadhim specifically mentions that the shrimps are allowed. So that gives us an indication um, that it's permissible. Mm. So some people may you know, you refer back to your maraja, mm. uh, your grand scholars, and see what they say. However, I'm amazed at how many people out there today you'll find where things like oyster and uh, crab and lobster and calamari they made it very normal for themselves in this world. And I have to say something, and that is, you know, <coughs> if even if a person tells me, well, this is makruh, or that scholar said this, mm. I think God has given us so much in this world, which is halal without shek, which is, you know, halal for all mm. of us to use. Um, why go, to why go towards mm. the areas of doubt? Mm. I think that has an effect on even one's spiritual lives as well. Yeah. <laughs> Now, a question on kosher food, which is also really disputed within a lot of people. Surah Til Ma'ida, Ayah 5, states, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This day, good foods have been made lawful. And the food of those who are given the scripture is lawful for you, and your food is lawful for them. The yep. Jewish faith are Ahl al-Kitab. Yep. And what I'll do is actually I'll read it in Arabic as well, so sure. it's, it's clearer as well. So ayah number five. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Al-yawm uhillu lakum al-tayyibatu wa ta'amu al-ladheena utu al-kitabu hallun lakum. You know, here when we look at the interpretation of the Ahl al-Bayt alayhim as-salam, they, you know, there are people out there who, for example, have eaten, you know, they eat kosher because they say this is the meat of the people of Ahl al-Kitab, the Jewish and for example, community, and they say that that's why we're allowed to eat it, and they say that our, our slaughtering is similar. And while, yes, a lot of the principles of the way that we slaughter the animal is similar, um, of course, there is no uh, facing the animal towards qibla, you know, bismillah is not recited. But also, here in this ayah, Imam al-Sadiq was asked, when it says that the ta'am, tayyibat of Ahlul Kitab, that is permissible for you. He said, yes, the herbs, mm -hmm. the vegetables of Ahlul Kitab, mm -hmm. you can eat, no problem. But mm -hmm. it doesn't mean the meat of Ahlul Kitab. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that the majority of the maraja will make clear that you cannot eat the meat of Ahlul Kitab. I know that, there are, that in some of the madahib of our brothers and other schools in Islam, you'll find that they'll say, well, you know, you could go to a McDonald's or a Burger King, for example, or eat chicken and meat normally. Like many Muslims you'll find when they come to non-Muslim countries, uh, they've come from Saudi or they've come from Dubai or they've come from Kuwait, and you'll see them eating <coughs> meat and chicken everywhere. Either they think McDonald's is halal as it is in their countries, mm. or they say, well, these are Ahl al-Kitab. Why can't mm. I eat when the Quran says you can eat the food of Ahl al-Kitab? We say, yes, that's the herbs and the vegetables, but not the meat of Ahl al-Kitab. Let me give you a scenario, because we were asked this question actually. The person messages and asks, my wife became Shia and she was Hindu. Can she still eat at her parents or is it Najasa? 
she should, she, there should be no issue eating at her parents. You know, her parents, for example, have cooked a vegetarian meal. Um, and there's no issue. And I know many of these parents, they've gone through an extremely difficult time knowing that their daughter or their son has converted to another religion. It's not easy for mm. any parent to know that their daughter or son has converted to another religion. And then let alone on top of that, for you to say to their daughter or their son, you can't go back to your parents' house uh, to eat with them because they are impure. That's not the act or the manners of the religion mm -hmm. of Islam. Um, there's no issue on that. There are exceptions to every rule. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then Sayyidina, alcohol is negus. If I go to a restaurant and they serve alcohol, can I eat there? Well, I think when you're looking at the opinions of the maraja, as long as alcohol is not on your table, mm. then there is no issue eating at that restaurant. And then they divide even sitting in the table from obligatory precaution to haram. So for example, if a person sits at the table where there is alcohol, but doesn't eat, doesn't drink, just sits there. You'll find that Ayatollah Sistani, may Allah lengthen his life, he makes a distinction <clears throat> from the one who actually sits and drinks and eats on a table where others are drinking alcohol. Mm. And this could be something very interesting when it comes to even some of our people in the world who are in the world of banking or, for example, in the world of uh, law where they have to go to these dinners. Networking. Networking, or they go to a <coughs> conference away with their firm. Mm. And part of that conference is them having to socialize. Now, there are a couple of steps that can be taken. Either from day one, someone can make clear that a gathering where alcohol is going to be the center stage <laughs> is something that <coughs> I cannot go ahead with. Mm. It's against my principles. Some people think that that will bring a backlash from the company. Mm. On the contrary, sometimes that actually respect it more. brings more respect. Mm. Remember, whether it's us with our principles, the Sikhs with the protection of the turban that they may wear to work, the Jewish community with their, what they're wearing, for example, religiously when they go to work. Every religion have got members of its community who have got certain laws which they want to abide by even when they go to the workplace. And so those people will also mention areas which are boundaries for them. So one way to look at this issue is a person can turn around and say that from the beginning, I cannot. Another way, however, is, okay, I can come and socialize, but I cannot necessarily be there for the whole night. A third way is, that I can be there, I might sit at that table. Precaution has to be taken because still you cannot be sitting at a table where there is alcohol. But let's say there's a distinction between sitting there and then sitting and ordering mm -hmm. and socializing and passing around the bottles and, you know, cheers and cheers and cheers. No, that is prohibited. Yeah. What if the restaurant you are eating in, the majority of the income is from the alcohol sales? Does that make a difference? Well, it's got nothing to do with you. Mm. You know, you've got alcohol being sold, but you're sitting on the table, you've ordered. What fish did we say were allowed? Let me, For let example, me refer back to that. Yeah, we said that there's certain fish Codge. which are allowed. I said you ordered cod and chips. And at that moment, there's no issue. You know, nothing, mm. Not in your concern how that business is, mm. is running. I sent him, Sayyidina, um, in countries like Dubai, and I don't know what I'm eating, if it's halal or not, because Dubai is a bit of a, you know, accepts a lot of tourists as well. There's not many... I said there's a lot of people, expats living there as well. Do I need to ask, for example, for enter a Burger King, do I need to ask if it's halal or not? Once you see that whopper, you know you're not you're asking. Not, you're not going to ask. There's no way you're asking anyone. I know you, you're certainly not asking. Duty <laughs> free. Straight, no Straight. one's asking, bro. But this, this is Suq al mm. You know, At the end of the day, this is a country where you have people who believe in La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah. And, you know, when you're there, you know, we have a principle in Islamic law. And if you read the books, you know, of the principles of Islamic law, not just the books of Usul al-Fiqh, but also Qawa'a al-Fiqhiyya, which we have, 
which make it clear that, you know, when you're in this Muslim country, there's no need to ask. Mm. You're in a Muslim country, and that should be enough, of mm. course, unless we gather uh, a sufficient amount of information that's making clear for us that there's a major problem. Otherwise, no. <coughs> yeah. uh, okay, we've spoken about eating or sitting in a place that serves alcohol. What happens, you know, if someone's forced to work in a place that serves alcohol or pork even? Is it permissible? I think... I think when you're looking at the laws, alcohol is a major problem. You know, in terms of Islamic law, there's no real loopholes there whatsoever. Mm. You know, let's say, for example, when you're looking at, let's say, start on the base level. You're in a non-Muslim country. You might have got a job where you're involved in the serving of chicken and meat, which is not halal. Mm. On that base level, you know, you're serving it to a group of people who themselves deem it as lawful, you know, and you know it's unlawful. That's on the base level. Then after that comes pork and then after that comes alcohol mm. in terms of prohibitions. So you'll find that, okay, someone says to you, I'm serving chicken, I'm serving meat, I'm serving beef, but that which is not necessarily halal. You might say, okay, I'm living in this non-Muslim country and this is something which they know is lawful, which I know is unlawful, but for them it's for them lawful. lawful. I'm serving Ahlul Kitab. Mm. Yep. Then pork, with pork you have a major issue when it comes to being the person who is actually selling pork. Um, but then, you know, some ulama will bring in the odd concept of, some might bring in the concept of istinqad, that I'm taking the money back from the non-Muslim <laughs> um, that's you a know, classic others. argument for a lot of things, actually. But yeah, <laughs> they use that for interest. They use that for so many other things, banking and mortgage and, and so on, and, mm. and you know, uh, especially in the finance world. So when it comes to pork, for example, again, there is a great amount of uh, discretion to be taken when you're looking at Islamic law as to the, you know, the selling of pork and helping pork being uh, sold. But when it comes to alcohol, alcohol is a major no-go area. Mm. Um, there's hardly any loophole that anyone can find when it comes to you being someone who's picking up the alcohol, serving the alcohol, distributing the alcohol, washing the dishes mm. for the uh, alcohol as well. Mm. Yeah. That was actually going to be my next question in regards to washing the dishes. Mm. You've made clear that alcohol is completely prohibited. But for example, let's say the pork. If someone was forced to wash the dishes and for example, a dish of pork came through, can they wash that or do they say, you know, excuse me, no, you can wash it. There's no, there's no mm. harm with you washing it. But mm. being part... Well, as I said, there's a difference between the laws when it comes to pork and alcohol. Mm. Um, where there is a lot of prohibition in both of them. But alcohol definitely in all accounts. But when it comes to that washing of the dishes, one may argue that when it comes to it, your, your job is to just... Whatever dishes are brought to you, you wash them. You make sure they're clean. Um, but really shouldn't be in a situation where you're part of the preparation of pork mm. dishes given to people to eat. What about foods like rabbit or frog? In many cultures, they do eat these animals. Can, is it permissible to serve this food to those who find it permissible? Yes, no problem. No problem at all. Rabbit or frog, we have, you know, in, in Shi'i law, rabbit is haram. Mm. In some of the madhabs of other schools in Islam, rabbit is allowed. In terms of frogs, you may find that there are Christians who may eat frogs or frog legs. Those people who deem it as permissible, there's no harm of serving them. Let's remind the viewers that they can call in for this part of the show on 203 5150199. Please call in the numbers on the screen. Your questions will be directed straight to the Sayyid, inshallah. Sayyid, now I have a question here. Um, is it permissible to eat halal food which has been steam cooked with the steam? of the meat is not slaughtered to Islamic laws? Ayatollah Sistani has a, has a problem with that mm. because the wetness will have an effect on, mm. the, on the halal food. Yeah. So not straight allowed. away not allowed. No. And do you have to, for example, if you're going to a restaurant... Remember, remember one thing, there's, mm. there's a major principle and that is 100% certainties. Mm. Islamic law doesn't work with 99%. 100%. 100% certainties. If a person turns around and says, I'm 99% certain that I saw that person there with their, with their wet hands touch the food and they are mm. not Ahl al 99 doesn't work. It's all 100% certainties. So even on questions like this, if you're 100% certainty that you know the steam of this dish, the wetness came onto the halal dish, then you cannot. If there is uncertainties, 
then it's okay you know uh, you know things like van and shek don't really work mm. in islamic law when it comes to conclusions i sent to say that. Now, there's a question here on fasting and i've thought this to myself a few times as well why specifically ramadan you have to fast in and what's how does it benefit to us physically to fast in this month for 30 days well i think that you know Every law in the religion of Islam is for the growth and the development and the evolution of the human mm. being. Um, if you're looking at the laws of prayers, for example, why did God make prayer obligatory? I could easily pray at the end of the night. But I know if salah is not obligatory, I am praying. Let me, you know, I'll be frank. If salah was not wajib, I'm not praying. If you tell me salah is mustahab, you tell me that you can pray if you want to. None of us are praying. The reason we pray is because we recognize at the beginning that our Lord has asked us. Our Lord, everything He asks from us is wise. <coughs> it's for our benefit. At the beginning, we may have prayed out of fear of hell. Then we prayed because we wanted Jannah, heaven. Mm. But then we prayed because we found that Allah has given us so much. It's worth bowing down mm. our heads and saying, thank you. Mm. Fasting. If you told someone, if you want to, Shah Ramadan, in Shah Ramadan, if you want to fast, I guarantee you, none of us would do it. You're telling me, from Fajr until Maghrib in London, you're expecting me to fast 18 hours, you'll have people going nuts. <laughs> <Death>. <laughs> They're like, no chance. When it was obligatory, we recognized, hold on, God has always given us laws with wisdom behind mm. them. It's obligatory. When I first start doing it, I'm doing it maybe out of fear of parents, maybe out of fear of, uh, out of, fear of God, community. Mm. But then, subhanAllah, how much you realize in the pangs of hunger when you're fasting, how much you realize how fortunate you are. The whole year you can buy any meal you want. <clears throat> and yet there are people in the world who have to go through this Ramadan effect virtually every day in their life. Me and you can literally order a meal at any second. I want pizza, I'm phoning pizza, I'm phoning, I want chicken, I want Chinese, I want Italian, I want Mexican, I want Indian, I want all of the dishes, I want Arab, Lebanese, whatever, all these dishes, I want them, one phone call, one app, one delivery, it's in my house. In the holy month of Ramadan, I realize how fortunate and blessed I am. That when I'm just feeling some hunger, how is it that those in certain villages in Africa, in India, in South America, mm. in the Middle East, cannot look forward to even a meal as luxurious as ours. I was flabbergasted in the work that I do with the Zahra Trust. In my position as special ambassador, we meet a lot of orphans, a lot of widows in different countries. And I was flabbergasted when I saw that chicken is a luxury for some families in Iraq today. Meat is a luxury. You need to have a bit extra money to be able to have mm. meat for the house. For us right now at this moment, if we said that we can go out anywhere, we'll have a meal. We don't even think twice about it. We even mock the quality of a meal, even if it's 50 pounds, 100 pounds, 300 pounds, you'll mock it and be like, well, you know, it was all right. There are people out there have never had that honor. The holy month of Ramadan humbles the human being. Mm. When you're fasting, number two, you need to give that stomach a rest. Although, mind you, the way Muslims break their iftar, the stomach got no rest. <laughs> I remember in Iraq when I was there last year, when I was looking at how people break their fast in Iraq, <coughs> I've never seen human beings build mountains on their food. You actually saw people go to the buffet. They came back with like a mountain. And the aim of fasting wasn't for you to suddenly eat that much when you break your fast. Mm. But rather, how can I now balance a spiritual, physical, healthy mm. life? Mm. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, you look at the words of his, <coughs> never finish a meal full. Mm. Don't finish a meal where you're in a state where you're feeling heavy. That brings laziness, lethargicness, 
leave a certain amount of space, move on to the next meal. You see some of our people, Shahana Madaf, it's unbelievable. Knocked out. <laughs> and then knocked. <laughs> Fully knocked. Knocked. <laughs> now, Alhamdulillah, God is so merciful that He says in the holy month of Ramadan, even your sleep is a form of worship. <laughs> but Let, God let's not judge these people. Maybe they're eating so they can sleep easier. Very true. And so you have that, you have another mm. spiritual dimension to fasting, <clears throat> and that is where I recognize that I'm trying to save up my energy to serve Allah mm. subhanahu wa ta'ala in that month. So the holy month of Ramadan is amazing the blessing it brings, the smiles it brings, mm -hmm. the unity it brings. It's a, it's a remarkable month. And when you're looking at scientific studies in the world today, how many studies are telling us you stay away from food for certain hours? Mm -hmm. You fast two days a week. And the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, for example, told us Mondays and Thursdays, try and fast. For example, you should fast the 13th and 14th and 15th of every month. It's as if you fasted the whole month. The religion of Islam with fasting speaks about fasting in such depth that when people today are going to all the nutritionists and dietitians and going to all their doctors looking mm. for advice, every doctor is coming back and saying, what? Fast. Fast. Mm. Fast a couple days in the week. Fast. And yet you find the beauty of the religion has already spoken about this. Mm. 1,400 years ago. Yeah. And now it's coming up. Sayyidina, a lot of people don't really think about this. They don't think about the eating habits of Rasulullah and the Ahl bayt They don't think about the sleeping habits. These are very important things that we can apply in our life. So my question is, do we know what the eating habits were? I know you mentioned, for example, fasting on certain days of the week. But for example, what foods would they eat? How much would they eat of each portion? I always look back at one particular night, and that was the night of the martyrdom of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And do you remember the conversation where his daughter brings him food? Mm. And he turns around to her and he says, when have you known me to eat so much? And you know when someone says that to you, you think the meal must be timman uqimah, timman betinjan, timman dajjaj, or fasajun, or sabzi, and all these Iraqi dishes that our Iraqi viewers will know. And khobuz laham, I, I'm going to mention khobuz laham because that's probably the only <laughs> Iraqi thing of all those dishes that I <laughs> mentioned. I think khobuz laham is our creation. It's like our, our unique achievement in, 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 in the Iraqi world. But you think it's this really grand meal and, and you're reading the narrations of like a bit of yogurt, a bit of bread, a bit of onions. You know, when you look at Imam Ali's life generally, it's very... And it's not... You know, when you're looking at his life and you see that the only bread that he eats is hard bread. The unhealthy bread that people eat is always a soft white. True. Mm -hmm. But what's the healthy bread that people eat? It's the brown, the brown bread, harder yeah. bread. And Imam Ali salam, was known that the bread that he'd eat, very hard to break. At, that isn't that white soft bread, is it? That white soft bread, easy. But the dietitians say to you, have brown bread. Imam Ali salam, therefore, when you're hearing about his prowess on the battlefield, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Badr, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Uhud, Khandaq, Khaybar, Hunayn, Jamal, Safin, Nahrawan, there's no chance that the man mm. was an unhealthy man. The man's food intake was a disciplined food intake. Mm. There was a recognition of natural food, of organic food, um, and and that is just one of the many indications of the eating habits of the Arabs. But one thing about the Ahlul Bayt as well is that they didn't mind giving their food away. Mm. As you a know, form of charity. I always mm. uh, joke with people whenever they're giving you, you know, crisps or chips, that when you say to someone, give me your crisps or chips, they'll always close it a bit <laughs> so you don't take too much from them. Just grab the box. Grab the box. <laughs> and you got really, you got some people, when it comes to the food that they have, they won't share. Yet, yeah, you're talking of food and the right of the stomach, the Ahlul Bayt, mm. they give away from themselves. They love that food. You know, mm. it's not give away food for the love of Allah. Give away the food that they love. Shows true sacrifice. Mm. It's not easy for a person to mm. give away the food that they've prepared. But, there is this wonderful spirituality where I can give away. Mm -hmm. 
على انفسهم ولو كان بهم خصاصه احسنتم سيدنا انا uh, اكتب دولف ديبا انت ذا بو دو هاف ا كولا اون ذا لاين سلام عليكم سلام عليكم كم هاف يور نيم اند وير يو ار كولينج فروم بليز وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله انا مرتضى فروم انديا بنغلور ويلكم ويلكم Uh, we love the people of Bangalore. There's a lot of Shia doing great work there. Lovely and people. Great, Lovely great people. events to promote the love of the Ahlul Bayt. Lovely Bay. people. Please present your question to Sayyid Ammar. Sayyid Ammar, uh, firstly, thank you, Sayyid Ammar, for, the, <laughs> for uh, all the knowledge you've been giving us in the past days. Uh, we get especially, I get especially in the night to listen to the show, you know, at 2 a.m. because air is live and I won't watch it. I have one question to ask when it comes to halal and haram. Uh, we eat. Uh, Over here, we know the maximum crowd that uh, we have over here population is non ahl al kitab. Uh, so in that context, when we go to a restaurant where they say the meat is not halal and they serve pork, but if we have to eat veg over there for some reason, is it okay to eat knowing that the people who handle our food or also the people who handle the meat, which is not halal or not just? Mm. That's my question. Thank you. As I said, um, Not all the maraja say that that food which is prepared by, ahl al, by non ahl al kitab, non people of the book, is prohibited. Not all maraja. Mm. There are maraja who have no problem with a person eating food which is not from the people of the book. Mm. Many think that eating the food of the people uh, who are not people of the book is completely prohibited in the Shia law mm. or the Shia legal system. This is not true. Uh, secondly, if you have a place which is selling pork, not selling halal food, but just down the road, three shops down the road, there is a place which is selling halal meat, for example, or halal food, then you shouldn't really be in a situation of difficulty. You should just go to that other place. However, also sometimes you're obliged, someone brings you a nice sweet dish or vegetable dish, who is not from the people of the book, but they bring it to you on Eid as a gift. Mm. It's not akhlaq to reject this food, mm. you know? Uh, some people will turn around and say, no, I will never eat it. On the contrary, this comes from a, a soft-hearted human being. Mm. There's no issue there. Ahsantum, Sayyidina, we do have a few more questions, but unfortunately, we are coming towards the end of our show. So thank you for you know helping us answer a lot of these questions. My pleasure. Which is going to save a lot of arguments next time we go to a couple of restaurants in London. Inshallah. Uh, but... On that note, I'd like to thank you all, dear viewers, for tuning in, for sending us your questions, for calling in. Inshallah, we will see you in the next episode. We will continue with more rights, hopefully, inshallah, with Dr. Sir Amman Akshawani. But for now, we thank him, we thank you, and we say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.